Okay, I think we should start. So the um, this is I had a chance to uh, look through the beginning of this article, and uh, you might be interested to find out this maybe more than you're interested in. But um, according to this guy, the reason for the list of suitable topics for discussion is because the scholars on the Nishi side, these are people called Kangaku. Kangaku is a is a is a um, kind of a title that you get when this, um, when you're put into a small committee of people who has the authority to regulate the teachings, okay? Uh, and that that group decided at some point that in fact Shinran's teachings had been corrupted, had been changed by the influence of later Shinshu thinkers like Kakunyo and Renyo, okay? Uh, and Zonkaku. So that the purpose of curating this list of topics was to purge those other influences from Shinshu doctrine. So in fact, that tells you that in fact there's a recognition that there are differences um, within the tradition as the tradition grew and developed. And that's quite striking. So for example, one of the issues in the, um, that I'm concerned about is this, uh, there's a term called Kiho Ittai. Ki refers to humans, O is the Dharma, Itai means unity, okay? Kiho Itai is a term that Renyo uses a lot. It's from a text called the Anjin Ketsu Josho, which the Higashi people decided was a Jodoshu text, not a Shinshu text at all, but Renyo loved it and talked about it all the time. And apparently um, the Nishi people also began to feel a little insecure about it. So in this list of suitable topics for Discussion, you're not allowed to read the Anjin Ketsu Josho, you're allowed to read Renyo's interpretation of Kiyo Itai, that's it, okay? So, that's the way they try to limit things. So, I mean, in some sense, um, you know, to me this is kind of historically interesting for all of you, deciding whether or not you feel limited by this is a whole other matter. And, um, but, you, but it's certainly an example of how this kind of discussion of what is appropriate, what is not appropriate, what is considered heretical, what is considered orthodox, is always fraught with tension. And who, who has the right to determine what is a proper, improper interpretation? And in that sense, uh, as we talked in the very beginning today about the Tanisho being not the word of Shinran, um, nonetheless, the fact that Tanisho is so influential, so inspiring for so many people, um, then raises the question, well, if it isn't the work of Shinran, we have so many things that we are, we do know are the work of Shinran, because in the case of Shinran, it's unusual compared to other Kamakura period figures, and we have a lot in his own handwriting um, that can be confirmed as being by him, whereas in the case of Honen, for example, there's only one document in his own handwriting. So it's obvious that a lot of Honen's writings have been influenced by other people and changed. Uh, in the case of Shinran, you could point to an actual original text. On the other hand, the Kyogyo Shinsho shows a lot of corrections that Shinran himself made. He's constantly crossing things out and adding things in the margins. So at what stage, you know what I'm saying? The document that we have is the actual final thing or not? That's also up in the air. So, um, you know, determining what to do with that kind of information is, is tricky and that's something that you guys all have to work out. I'm fortunate I'm not inside the church, so I'm free. <laughs> to work as an outsider. Um, but I can tell you on the whole inside, um, there are certain terms that I, that when I see in Honen's writings, to me, signify the fact that this is not Honen's writing, or at least this part of it has been added. And I work with scholars in, the, in his sect, and more or less we're in agreement on that, okay? So at least, you know, they're, it's much harder for them to say that because they represent the church, right? And these are texts that are you know, used all the time in preaching and et cetera, et cetera. And so I say to them, I understand that. You guys have your position because you're an insider. You, you have to, you have a, you have an obligation, a duty to represent your tradition. I'm not ordained. I'm on the outside. And 
the response both on the Shin side and the Jodo Shu side is don't ordain. It's better if you don't ordain. <laughs> it's better if you stay outside. And then you're free to say stuff that we can't say. But we all benefit from it, right? So this speaks to the fact that, you know, what's the relationship between people like me who do historical Buddhist studies and how the religion actually functions, right? And in some sense, it's disruptive, and in some sense, it's positive, and not everybody reacts in the same way. But I can tell you that there's been a whole history for over 120 years or so of Japanese Buddhist scholarship in Japan causing huge unhappiness inside the religious institutions, which then led to some people being thrown out of the church, having defrocked, having their clerical status removed forcibly. They were declared heretics and no longer representative of the church. And then sometimes then they're asked 20 years later to come back. Yeah. Yeah. So, in a way, this is kind of uh, probably a natural process. Um, but not everybody feels the same way all the time. So, so the tiny shell is interesting because it's sort of in the middle of all this, right? And you can't help it that it's, uh, and that's why I like it, because it's disruptive and it's kind of, uh, some people work very hard for, to use a ton, to try to find other writings in Shinran to support the Tani Show. That's hard to do, actually. But Kakunyo says things that are very similar to the Tani Show. Some people at, at one point thought Kakunyo was the author of it. Um, but in any case, all right. So uh, having said that, um, let's look at the postscript, which is a bit longer. And um, you know, this is a funny text because it has a preface uh, and a kind of a second preface and then a postscript, you know. Um, so these things, why do we need such a thing? This, this is added by somebody, perhaps the author, perhaps not, to frame the content. That is, to give it a context that um, sort of justifies what they're doing and uh, decides, uh, tries to, you know, forcibly convince, write a convincing argument as to how this text should be used or how it should be read, that kind of thing. And uh, if you're lucky, the postscript is in the same, is written by the same person who writes the text, but that isn't always true. This is a very easy way, I can just tell you in terms of history of religious literature, this is a way, to, uh, the simplest way to change something afterward is to add a postscript, add an addendum, add something at the end that says, well, this should be read in you know, this, this manner as opposed to that manner. But, I mean, I have no opinion in this case. It could certainly, certainly be by Yuyan. I mean, the other thing to think about, of course, is who is Yuyan? Why should we believe him? What, where is his position in the history of Shinshu? And he's an interesting figure because, you know, he's married to, married to Shinran's daughter. It's like there's some family connection. Does somebody, anybody know what this is? Yuyan is married to Shinran's daughter's sister, no, daughter's, I don't know. There's some family connection. Maybe Shinran's daughter marries somebody and that guy's sister is married to Yuyan, something like that. So he's very, clearly very close to the family. Um, okay, so let's have, a, let's have our various readings. So why don't you start? You have Unno, right? Yeah, I have Unno. Okay. I feel that the preceding views all arise during differences in the understanding of true and trusting. According to our late master Shinran, it was the same time of his teacher Honan. Among his disciples, there were only a few people who truly entrusted themselves to Amida. This was once the cause of debate between Shinran and fellow disciples. When he claimed Shinran's entrusting and Honan's entrusting are identical, Seiken Nembutsu and others strongly refuted this, saying, How can you claim that our master's entrusting and your entrusting are identical? To this Shinran replied, Our master's wisdom and knowledge are truly profound. And to say that our entrusting to Amida are identical is preposterous. But as far as true entrusting leading to birth in the Pure Land is concerned, there is no difference exists at all. Both are the same. Still, they continued to press Shinron. 
challenge him, challenging him by saying, how can that be possible? They finally decided to settle the argument once and for all by going to Honan, relating the details. When Honan listened to their respective views, he said, true and, the true entrusting of Honan is a gift granted by the Tathagata. The true entrusting of Shinran is also a gift from the Tathagata. Thus, they are the same. People whose entrusting is different will probably not go to the same Pure Land as I. Such was the case in earlier times, and today it seems that among the followers of a single-hearted Nembutsu, there are some who do not share the same entrusting as that of Shinran. Although I may sound repetitious, I want to put this all down in writing. Since my life, like the dewdrop, still hangs into this body, which may be likened to withered grass, I am able to hear the doubts of my fellow practitioners and tell them that I have learned from my teacher. But I fear and lament that after my eyes close and life comes to an end, there may arise chaos because of divergent interpretations. When you are confused by different views, such as the above, you should carefully read the scriptures approved and used by our late master. Among scriptures generally, you will find a mixture of teachings which are true and real and which are accommodating and tentative. The master's basic instruction was for us to choose the real, abandoning those accommodating the desires of people and select the real, rejecting the, tentative, the tentatively project, presented. Be very careful to see such differences among the scriptures. I have listed a few statements that attest to true and trusting, including them here for easy reference. The Master constantly said, when I ponder on the compassionate vow of Amida, established through five kalpas of profound thought, it was for myself, Shinran alone, because I am being burdened so heavily by karma. I feel even more deeply grateful to the primal vow which is made so decisively to save me. As I now reflect upon these words, they are no different from the saying of Jean Tao. Truly know that this self is a foolish being of karmic evil, repeating birth and death since beginningless eons ago, forever drowning and wandering without ever knowing the path of liberation. How grateful I am that Shinran expressed this in his own person to make us deeply realize that we do not know the depth of karmic evil and that we do not know the height of the Tathagata's benevolence, both of which cause us to live in utter confusion. In reality, all of us, including myself, talk only about what is good and evil without thinking of the Tathagata's compassion. Our master once said, I do not know what I don't know what the two good and evil really mean. I could say that I know what good is if I knew good as thoroughly and completely as the Tathagata. I could say I know what evil is if I knew evil as thoroughly and completely as the Tathagata. But this foolish being filled with blind passion, living in this impermanent world like a burning house, all things are empty and vain, therefore untrue. Only the Nambutsu is true, real, and sincere. Among the lies we say to each other, one is truly to be lam lam lament lamented. This occurs when some people who, in talking about the Nambutsu, discuss true and trusting among themselves or try to explain it to others. And in order to silence people or stop further inquiry, they even ascribe words to Shinran which were never spoken by him. How deplorable and regrettable this is. You should carefully think about this and reflect on it. Although the above are not all my own words, they may at times sound a bit strange because I am not too well versed in the sutras and commentaries. I also have yet to clearly perceive the depths of the teaching, but I have tried my best to recall some fragments, perhaps one one hundredth of what the late Shinran taught and have put them down in writing. How sad it is if those who are fortunate enough to say the Nembutsu are not immediately born in the land of fulfillment, but must continue residing in the borderland. 
in tears I have dipped my brush in ink and have written this in hope that conflicting views of true and trusting will not prevail among fellow practitioners of the Nembutsu gathered together in a single room. Thus I have called this Tanisho, lamenting the deviations. It should not be shown to outsiders. <laughs> All right, so this is rather long. I don't know if we want to read all the translations, but why don't you read the Arai one? Because that's the only one that's new, right? That might be something different. I feel that all these erroneous views discussed above have originated from an understanding that differs from the true faith taught by Shinran. The late Master Shinran once told me the following story. Although Master Honen had many disciples, only a few of them shared the same faith, Shinji, with Honen. One day, Shinran got into an argument with some fellow disciples. When Shinran said, My faith and Master Honen's faith are one and the same, others like Seikanbo and Nembutsubo strongly accused him, saying, How in the world can your faith be the same as our Master's? Then Shinran replied, It would be absurd if I said that my wisdom and knowledge were equal to our Master's which are broad and profound, but as far as the true faith changing, leading to birth in the pure land is concerned, <coughs> mine is not at all different from his. They are one and the same. However, because they kept accusing Shinran of talking nonsense, he proposed that they all should go to Master Honen and ask him to determine who was right and who was wrong. When they explained the details of their argument to Honen, he said, My faith was a gift from the Tathagata and that of Zen Shinbo, Shinran also was a gift from the Tathagata. Therefore, his faith and mine are one and the same. Persons who have a different kind of faith will by no means be born in the same pure land as I will. This story tells us that even among the people of those days who followed the teaching of the exclusive practice of Nembutsu, there were some who did not have the same faith as Shinran. This is an often told story, but I am putting it down here. As long as my dewdrop like life clings to this dead grass-like body, I can hear questions from persons who associate with me and convey to them the words and teachings of the late Master Shinran. However, I worry and lament that after my eyes are closed, people will be left in great confusion. My advice to present and my advice to present and future Nembutsu practice, practicers is that they read the sacred texts which the late master approved and used for himself, especially if they come in danger of being misguided by those persons with such divergent views as mentioned earlier. Broadly speaking, sacred texts consist of true and real ones and provisional and temporary ones. By throwing away the provisional ones and taking the real ones, and by putting aside the temporary ones and using the true ones, you will be truly in accord with the late Master Shinran's wishes. By all means, you should depend on the right texts and avoid being misguided by erroneous views. I have quoted here some of the important testimonies and attached them to this work so that they serve you as the basis for understanding the teaching. Master Shinran would often say, as I deeply considered the vow which Amida established after a five kalpa long contemplation, it was solely for myself, Shinran alone. Therefore, I am deeply grateful to the primal vow for resolving to save such a heavily karmic bound person as I am. As I now consider this statement by Shinran again, I realize that it is not at all different from the golden maxim by Shandao. We should know that we really are ordinary foolish beings, burdened with karmic evil and repeating births and deaths and that ever since unaccountable kalpas ago, we have been ceaselessly sunk and ceaselessly transmigrating bereft of any karmic condition for emancipation. This realization makes me appreciate Shinran's statement even more. He mentioned his inner awareness in order to awaken to us to the fact that we are lost and confused without realizing the depth of our karmic evil and the boundlessness of the Tathagata's benevolence. In reality, Everyone, including myself, without thinking of the Tathagata's lofty benevolence, talks only about good and evil. Shinran once said, I do not know whatsoever what is meant by the two words, good and evil. The reason is, I would know that something is good if I had the capacity to know good as thoroughly as the Tathagata knows it, 
And I would know that something is evil if I had the capacity to know evil as thoroughly as the Tathagata knows it. However, we are all ordinary, ordinary foolish beings filled with blind passions, and this is a world of impermanence, like a burning house. Everything is false, vain, and empty. Only the Nembutsu is true and sincere. While we say only empty things to each other, there is one thing that really pains me. That is, when people discuss the meanings of saying the Nembutsu and entrusting ourselves to Amida and explaining their understandings to others, some persons, in order to shut others up, or when the argument falsely quote certain words, never mention Mashinan. I find this regrettable and lamentable. They should carefully reflect upon this and make sure not to commit such excesses. The words in this work are not the creation of my arbitrary thought, but they must at times sound odd because I am not well versed in the passages of sutras and commentaries, nor do I know which parts of the sacred texts are profound or shallow. Even so, I have recollected and put down here one hundredth, only a fragment of what the late Master Shunan said to me. How lamentable it is that some people who are so fortunately have come to say the Nimbutsu are not able to be born in fulfilled land, but have to find their abode in the borderland. I, tear for, I tearfully took up my writing brush and wrote this document so that no Nimbutsu practicer should go astray from the way Shinran entrusted himself to the vow. I have called it Notes and Laments and the Deviations. And this should not be shown to outsiders. Thank you, Spirit. Um, so these are the points that for me are kind of salient in this last bit. Um, and there's one more that I didn't, I'm going to say also. What's that? Clearly, the Tanish, this tells us the Shin, that Yui and whoever wrote this after Shinran had died. Okay. So that tells you that, therefore, Shinran could not have confirmed what's in here. That for the people who doubt the authenticity of it, this is fuel for their fire. Okay? Um, and this also tells us that, in fact, there's a great deal of fear uh, within the Shin community that there are interpretations that are inaccurate and uh, potentially dangerous. Okay? So, some of which we just looked at. Now, um, it's very clear from this final statement also that, you know, Yulian is sort of confessing that this is my understanding of what Shinran said, okay? And so this also tells us that you're really looking at one person's view. Now, Kakunyo is one person's view, Zongkaku is one person's view, all these people are just giving their own personal interpretation. What's fascinating to me is uh, this admission that this is just what I understood and I'm really worried about people getting the wrong interpretation, so I'm going to tell you what he actually said under the presumption that somehow Yuin remembers exactly what Shinran said totally accurately, which you know is impossible, um, but of course he had to believe that. That was the basis of his faith. The second thing that's striking to me is I see that as being very much in contrast to this idea that if you have the proper Shinji, your faith is identical. Mm -hmm. So the implication is that my understanding is the same as Shinran's, and Shinran also was concerned about the same point, and, went, and he uh, recounts a conversation that Shinran told him about his, when Shinran was talking with other disciples of Honen, when Honen was not there, right? Just like when Yuyan is having this conversation when Shinran is not there, right? And Shinran boasts that, I'm sure my faith is the same as Honen's. And they say, how the hell do you know that? Now, these other people that he mentions um, are considered orthodox people by the Jodo sect, you know. Mm -hmm. But they did not presume that their understanding would be the same as Shinran. And to me, this is a very kind of odd point. Um, what did Shinran really mean when he said that my faith is the same as that of Honen's? 
I don't know if you guys feel that you have to somehow confirm that your faith is the same as that of anybody's, or that your student is the same, has the same faith as you. It's a very hard claim to make, considering all the things that are involved in whatever faith is, right? It's very tricky. So, um, so when he first, the way he t recounts this story, when he first talks about it, the response of the other students of Honan is, of course, how the hell can you know that? Uh, which is what I would say if someone told me the same thing today. Um, but then notice the way he answers that. And the way the, the answer to that doubt is, Honan confirms that his own faith comes from the Buddha. That's all. That's the limited definition of it, right? He doesn't go into the content of it all. He says that that's how I got it, okay? And in that sense, Shinran can say, yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that the other people have the same view, you know what I'm saying? So, it's a very interesting kind of fuzzy, <laughs> fuzzy question. Um, and so, I guess the takeaway from that, whether you Yen intended this or not, is that as long as you understand that part of it, right, you can have confidence that your faith is the same, at least that aspect of it. Okay, so let's talk about some of the other things that are in this epilogue, or final... What do you want to call it? One is uh, this notion that only the Nimbutsu is true. It's a very interesting statement. Uh, it doesn't tell you what's false, it just tells you that only the Nimbutsu is true. Well, so what does that mean? You know, does that mean other practices are not true? Does that mean nothing else in the world is true but Nimbutsu? Okay. Um, and there's a lot of ways to think about this. I'm very curious to hear what you guys say. I have my own interpretation, but I'd like to... <coughs> Why would he have to say this, okay? Yes? Well, um, I think it would be that... Uh, and part of my contextualization, I don't think I'm going to learn this awareness that the uh, Kamakura authorities were already getting nervous about this popular movement in the provinces that are most directly under their control. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I tend to agree with the interpretation of Shinra's life that basically he realized that he was being watched and so he took advantage of the fact he'd been pardoned by the imperial government to get back to Kyoto while getting his good. Uh, okay, but what about everybody else left behind? So, uh, uh, well, uh, good and evil are seen as conditionalized parts of this flux of birth and death that we live in. And then Utsu is from a higher order of things, if you want to look at that. Or Shinran says they from a deeper order. Uh, yeah, uh, and so... Higher order of what? Well, okay. That, that's a, yeah, that's a Christian way of thinking. Shinran, I'm talking about going deeper. Well, deeper or higher, whatever way. I, what, my, what, what I want to know is if the Nimbus, only the Nimbus is true, what is it that's not true? What are we talking about here? How do you read that? Because you could read that different ways. What's that? I mean, it seems to imply that other things are. What things? As other practices. Practices right? is the most obvious yeah. interpretation. Yeah. Uh, I mean, G. Ricky, he's been basically, all the pages prior to this, has been a long slamming of anything that has to do with G. Ricky. Like, <laughs> that alone is like, oh, well, you don't have the power, we're foolish beings. And this is just the proof that. Jiriki can't handle it, all the Nimbus can handle it, you have nothing, this is the cherry on top of that cake. Okay, so, yeah. I was going to say that in the context of uh, the statement, only the Nimbus is true, uh, in the sentence before he's talking about this fleeting world, this burning house. Exactly, so that's why I don't think this is about practice. I don't think that's mm -hmm. what that statement means. Because after all, there's Jiriki Nimbus also, okay? So, uh, I, I think this is a more kind of an ontological statement. It's about the nature of reality, is what I think he's saying. I think that's, that's my understanding of Shinran's view of Nimbutsu. And, and that way, Shinran really uh, kind of jumps outside the normal way of talking about Buddhist concepts. So, this goes back to, um, there's something else in here, which is uh, here. Provisional teachings versus the true teachings, right? A couple of times he talks about, you know, you, uh, Shimon wants us to, there's provisional teachings and true teachings, we're supposed to cling to the true teachings and, and give up the provisional ones, but he doesn't clarify what that is. This distinction is a, um, 
standard Mahayana discourse, and nothing particularly Shinran about this. Uh, and the word that matters here, there's a word pranyapti in Sanskrit, but that's a word you probably don't know. Just use the word upaya, mm -hmm. you know, as a, as a means, right? As a temporary response. So in Japanese, there's a phrase taiki seppo. Taiki ki is the individual ability of the person. Tai is in, contra, in, uh, in reference to that ki. Seppo is preaching the Dharma. You preach the Dharma in reference to the person you're talking to. Okay? Therefore, uh, the Buddha can say things that are not specifically, directly true, but they lead to a positive revelation of the truth, okay? That's upaya. There's lots of that all throughout the Buddha's canon. And uh, that's standard Tendai doctrine. And Shinran learned that backwards and forwards. And Honan did everybody at that time. They're all products of Tendai. So there's nothing new about that. Uh, and ultimately, this kind of, it's sort of a generic statement. Cling to what's true and don't cling to what's a, a, a instrumental, right, in getting to the truth. But that also, of course, leaves the question of what is it that's true? What is it that's just instrumental? And um, people can have a strong disagreement about that. So that's another tricky thing. So I think if you think of that problematic, and then you drop Nembutsu in there, and then you, within that problem, now you say only the Nembutsu is real. That's one way to look at this problem, is to say, of all the teachings, the only one that's actually true is Nembutsu. Everything else, right, is just a means to get here, okay? That's remarkable. And that puts Nembutsu in an entirely different category than everything else in Buddhism, including the sutras. Got it? including the Pure Land Sutras, including Amitabha Buddha himself, because after all, I'm just giving you a kind of standard Nagarjuna Mahayana uh, approach to things. The sutras are all provisional. You don't read the sutra, you don't see the Buddha, you see an expression of a reference to the Buddha. It's all referential. It's all, you know, representational of what lies behind it, right? And so in that sense, all the sutras are language, everything that's language in Buddhism, and this is again coming from India, all language, including religious language, is provisional. It's all upaya, because words mean different things to different people. So even if you hold up the sutra and say, this is the word, this is the word of God, yeah? This is the word of the Lord, right? You walk down the center of the church. This is the word of the Buddha. Okay, that's fine, but then how do I know that I understand that word the way you understand that word, and the way you understand that word? You can't know that. And what's fascinating about Buddhism is that they talk about that very right, clearly, okay? That we all understand the words of the Buddha differently. And therefore, the words are, the word in Sanskrit is prapancha. It's prapancha. It's like, you know, some temporary linguistic expression that could go this way, could go that way, and so we're going to look at it differently. And that's a problem. So when you, when you go toward the strong madhyamaka or kind of emptiness side of Buddhist rhetoric in India, you see this critique is very powerful. And that's in Tendai as well. Shinran knows all about that. Honen knows all about that. Um, but then that doesn't leave you anything to hold on to. Nagarjuna's point was that don't hold on to anything, and then you'll see the truth. Because everything you hold on to is merely provisional again, right? So what Shinran is saying is, yeah, everything is provisional except Nimbutsu, right? So this is a way to create a simple, right? A symbolic logic that can somehow rise up out of that morass of ambiguity, right? And say, this is unambiguous. Yeah. But is Nembutsu really what matters, or is the Shinjin behind the Nembutsu that what matters? Well, that's part of the Tanisho rhetoric also yeah. talks about that too. You yeah. believe in the vow, you believe in the Buddha, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, ultimately, Nembutsu itself is a symbol. You can't deny it, it functions in a symbolic way. It is, therefore, both real and provisional. And so nothing can escape this. Nothing can escape this. Your own life, your own identity is also provisional. You know, all these, there's no, there's no way out of this morass, right? But, so what I would suggest to you is what Shinran is doing is something that Honan sort of, I think, also is doing, but it's less clear. But it's quite clear in, in Shinran, which is that the Nembutsu is the Buddha himself. But the Nembutsu is, in a sense, uh, Nirmanaka. It's an expression of the Buddha that is available to us to call forth. Mm -hmm. And that's the power of the voice, right? Yeah. Done in this context. And that's really, really strong. So what you see after Honan does this, 
suddenly other people in Japan, like Dogen on the Zen side, start saying, yeah, Zazen is the Buddha, you know? In other words, suddenly all these kinds of particular, you have to choose a practice and then you imbue the practice with your understanding that this represents the Buddha. What the Buddha wants to communicate to you is do this thing, get into that thing, and then you join, right, this kind of sacred realm. Whether you understand it or not, you participate in it, and somehow it's like vibrating, you know, kind of lifts you up. So I think that's what's going on here, and that's that's very very powerful. Um, you guys okay with that? <laughs> Don't throw no, anything. I just remember yeah. an earlier lecture. The point you made is that uh, we're getting into a period in which, yeah, Nimbutsu is seen as having agency. It's, uh, that's right, and so therefore, the, it's not surprising that people would see the Nimbutsu as having agency. Because if, the, if you see the Nimbutsu as an expression of the Buddha, of course it should have agency. And Ipen, Shinran doesn't say this, but Ipen says this. What does Ipen say? Ipen says, I'll give it to you in Japanese and I'll give it to you in English. I don't say the Nimbutsu, the Nimbutsu says the Nimbutsu. In other words, Ipen says, I'm just a vehicle, you know. The nimbus that comes through me and comes out my mouth, comes out in my dance and everything I do, you know. So that's all comes from Honen. Honen is the one that throws that out and people go, oh my God, oh my God, how could that be, right? But you can see why this is a threat to the establishment because it means all that other study and practice is of a secondary nature, right? This nimbus has this kind of special authority. Um, now, on this note, I would also like to point out here, and this is very important for BCA and Shin Buddhism in America, that the phrase here is Nembutsu practicers, or when I say practitioners. Notice that? You practice Nembutsu. It's not something you believe in only, but you're supposed to be doing it. Okay? And that's something that's really, to me, well, I don't want to be too critical, but somewhat problematic, you know? Uh, and this is true in Nishi culture in Japan as well. Higashi is not so much, but Nishi side very much so. So, when I go, you know, when I'm at Jodoshu gatherings, all meetings begin with ten recitations of Nembutsu and end with ten recitations of Nembutsu. It's said vigorously. When I go to Shinshu meetings, it's no, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, let's see if you think so. You're gonna give, give like lip service to Namo. You know, you're gonna have to say it once. You know. There's no sense you're actually doing or practicing Nembutsu, and I think that's a really hard way to go. And the Tanisha reminds you that even for Shinran, he considers himself a Nembutsu Gyoja, a practitioner, right? The practice is very much at the heart of this, right? And, you know, you don't have, I don't have to explain why that is, but all right. anyway. Um, okay. Only somebody says something when I say that, okay? <laughs> Shiran says, I cannot distinguish between good and evil. I don't know what that is. How do you guys relate to that? Uh, it's a pretty interesting statement. Hmm. Well, I, th I think the responses that you got so far basically delineate the whole issue. And I guess I, this is just my own perspective. But as I see it, it is ultimately an unresolvable problem. Um, which I guess is probably what Shinran is trying to get us to see. Yeah, all these issues ultimately are unresolvable, though he holds with absolute other power. Because we're not going to be able to Shinran use never uses that term, by the way. By the absolute other power, that's Kyozawa Manchi. That's Higashi Honganji <laughs> modernism. Mm. Nobody uses that term until the 20th century. And it turns out Kyozawa himself didn't even say it. That's actually Akegara Sohaya who rewrote Kiyozawa's essay and put it in there, okay? Oh, he's the guy. He's the guy. <laughs> okay. yeah. So this term, it's very interesting to me that this term, absolute other power, everybody talks about this now. <laughs> this is a 20th century invention, okay? Um, and other, obviously other powers are very central, but nobody says absolute other power. But if you say absolute other power, then you're excused from not doing practice, right? What's the point? It's irrelevant, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I think, again, that's a misinterpretation. You have to be very, very careful about this. Um, it's true that Shinran, and it's in the Tani Show as well, doesn't believe in an instrumental view of Nembutsu. You don't do Nembutsu as a means to get to some place, right? 
Maybe you do Nembutsu as an expression of gratitude, whatever, but nonetheless you practice Nembutsu because if anything, the practice helps you focus. It increases your mindfulness. It increases your kind of sensitivity, the depth of your understanding, etc., etc. And it's a discipline, you know. And I, there's no doubt in my mind that Shinran was involved in this. No doubt at all. I cannot distinguish good from evil. So that's a wonderful, beautiful statement of honesty. But well, what's the problem here? There's a problem here. The problem is that this leads to antinomianism. The problem is this leads to saying, well, therefore, I'm no one to judge what's good or bad. I have nothing to say about what you do. You stole someone's purse? Well, you know, what do I know? Maybe you needed to eat lunch. You know? um, and this is the basis upon which Jodo Shinshu was persecuted century after century after century until Renyo created an army to kick the shit out of everybody else. Essentially. So, um, this is a problem. So what's happening here is, Shiran is speaking on a purely spiritual level. He's not speaking on, speaking on a level in terms of community responsibility, as a leader, or anything like that. This is like a personal communication he says to this group of people in which he lectured perhaps, and Yuyan wrote down, took notes on what he said, or remembered what he said. Um, and this is another distinction, this is another way that in which Shinran's writings are different than Honen's writings. As I mentioned before, because Honen is a very public person, and he's a celebrity, and therefore he can't get away with saying anybody without somebody noticing, right, and commenting. So Honen is very careful. Honen would never say something like this, I don't know what's good or what's evil. Or if he did, he would put it in a very careful context to say, I'm in no position to judge you, but, you know. But Shinran can get away with this because he doesn't have a public persona, because he's unknown. Um, he speaks to his followers, and he's speaking on a truly religious, spiritual level, and that's one thing that makes Shinran's writing so attractive, right? And we're seeing it here as well. So that's why, in Italian, repeatedly, Shinran says, what the hell do I know, you know? I'm just an ordinary person, I don't know what good is, I don't know what bad is, I'm probably just as bad as anybody else. And then some people even think that this huge discussion of Achatashatru, who murdered his father in the Kyoga Shinsho, this long, long quotation. This is a, you know, Shona has two things in the Kyoga, I'll leave the Tanah Show aside for a second. In the Kyoga Shinsho, you know, which is clearly Shinran's most carefully written piece, because he rewrote it and rewrote it over and over again. There are two enormously long quotations, okay? They're not from the Pure Land Sutras. They're, what are they from? One is from the Nirvana Sutra discussion of how Ajatasatru is forgiven by Shakyamuni, okay? And when he talks about murdering his father and confessing it, and the importance of confession to, to, to being forgiven, something that you also do not see in Shinju culture. The second thing is this text called the Mapo Tomyoki, which Shinran quotes almost in its entirety, which is a text saying, that we're, in, we're at such a stage in Mapo now, there are no more monks anymore because monasticism is impossible, because no one can live by the precepts anymore. And so anyone who pretends to be a monk living by the precepts is fooling you. Fooling himself and fooling you. Um, both these statements are, have very strong antinomian <laughs> implications, okay? So the fact that Shimon can write this stuff in this way was used as fodder for complaints against Jodo Shin Buddhism as being socially dangerous. Right? That it doesn't have a sense of social obligation to teach right and wrong to its people, and therefore um, you know, we should shut it down. What if on and on and on. This went on over and over again. I'm not saying that, in fact I had a student this semester who wrote a paper on this, and he said, yeah, Shinran promoted anti human behavior, and all the students, all of his disciples promoted it as well, because somehow this made them feel that they were closer to Amitabha Buddha by doing bad things. Mm -hmm. We don't know that. We don't know how many people did anything terrible. All we have is the, the rhetorical level. We don't have any evidence of what actually happened, what people actually did. I mean, at one point, Renyu talks about burning Buddhist statues. Well, if that's a sin, that's not much of a sin, uh, well, in my view anyway. Maybe some people consider that also a heinous crime. You know, I don't know, like burning the Bible or something. But in any case, um, but the implications of this are important, and so that's why when you talk about this, you have to talk about it in the, 
in a particular context. You have to contextualize it. Um, Yuyan tries to do that to some degree here, but I would have liked him to do it a little bit more. <laughs> you know, that's all I'm saying. Okay, uh, what else we got here? The vowel is just for me, okay? So, I'm, that's a very, obviously, very powerful statement. I'm just curious to how you all interpret that, how you, how this can work. How the vow can be just for me when the Buddha says, anyone who blah, 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 blah. How do you guys understand that? How do you talk about that? You are wonderful, but I'd like to hear from someone else, like the woman next to you. Could you speak? How do you understand that? Who are you? I'm Tara. Tara. <clears throat> One thing I was sort of thinking about is like kind of what we were talking about earlier in terms of like different interpretations. Like um, when, like to me, it's gonna mean one thing, but to someone else, that would mean something else. Could be something else. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, for me, uh, the way I, I relate to that is that he's making a very personal statement. This is a personal experience, and then uh, to expand it. Further, if we're all interconnected, it then becomes our experience. Mm. So that, that's how I relate to that statement. Very interesting. So it's extremely personal, but yet it can for everybody. It's for everybody at the same time. Mm -hmm. mm. Good. Well, I use this quite a bit in my talks. This is the whole point for your relationship, that especially for us as priests, that you have to understand all this teaching is for you first. It's not something that you could teach somebody else. Mm -hmm. So when we give a Dharma talk or anything like that, it has to, you have to understand it's from your perspective. Okay. Right? All these other things, you don't know. So it has to be a very personal thing. So, you know, the, to me, also what's fascinating about that is that in, in reiterating this thing, I shouldn't have said this right in the time show earlier. You put this next to this business that I have the same faith as Homer, right? That I have the same faith as you. So on the one hand, it's very, very personal. On the other hand, it's the same, right? It's the same, but it's not the same. You know, it's, it's tricky stuff. Yeah. What about you? I'm going to pass. because You're going to pass? I'm a ringer. Oh. Maybe, for the next Maybe you're not allowed to pass. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you don't want to hear me. I'll talk later. All right. To me, it's very humbling. That was for me. Um, for the reasons that you mentioned, right? That it's this, that it's reachable for everyone, and I'm part of everyone. So. That doesn't sound personal, though. That sounds still more generic. Though. Well, to me, um, Shenron's whole story is so humbling. He is so humble. I think the essence of who he is is so humble. And honestly, I, I relate to that so much because of this whole idea of I can't distinguish between good and evil within myself, right? So, um... So, yeah, I, I like that, and I think, in, in essence, this is what, probably, what makes the Tanya Show the most powerful. The most powerful thing about the Tanya Show is the humility of Shinran coming yeah. through repeatedly over and over again in so many parts of it here again at the end, right? And to me, honestly, um, if you want to, you know, as a, someone that's trying to practice, as someone that's on the path, I feel like that's the thing that I find the most inspiring. That's the thing that I fall back on the most mm -hmm. because, um, Because I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anything. You know, at the end of the day, I feel like I know nothing. Maybe in the morning, I feel a little bit more. <laughs> at the end of the day, not so much. Can I tell you I, I, yeah. just a personal uh, <laughs> yeah. comment? This is just me, but when I finished my PhD at Cal, uh, I felt very uncomfortable on campus because the conclusion of my PhD was that I don't understand anything, <laughs> and so I left academia. I was uh, got a letter from Cornell asking me, saying you should apply for this job, like you know, you notice you, and, and I didn't do it. I said I can't, you know, because what I realized was that I don't understand anything, and so I felt very uncomfortable standing up in front of people I'm teaching. So I left, 
Um, very similar to what you're saying. Yeah. Like the more you study, the more you realize what you don't know, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm gonna this you may have probably butcher this quote, but he says earlier um, about the practice and that even if we're leading him into hell, the hell's where he belongs, right? It's the only thing he's capable of doing. And so in that sense, if this if the battle's going for him, that's all he's gonna take refuge in. That it's just for him. And that's part of I think Shinran's humility that attracts me to the teachings too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you feel that you are also you have you have to be in the same stance in the same boat as him? That you might be bound for hell also. Uh, I've, had what? People, I've had people personally accuse me like I'm <laughs> like, okay, well, okay. <laughs> okay, just curious. You know, because it seems to me this kind of thing, as powerful as it is, it's kind of hard to teach if you're the teacher and you say, "I got nothing to teach you," which is what right. Shimon says, right? Then. Yeah then what are we listening to you for? Right? you got nothing to teach us, right? So it's kind of a weird dynamic going on here. Shimon keeps saying, i got nothing to tell you, i got nothing to tell you, and then they, well, wait, let me ask you another question. You know? No, 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 i got nothing to tell you. Let me ask, well, all right, but I don't think, anyway, yeah. So what do you think? You know, I, I don't agree that, I, I don't think Shinron was bragging, you know, with this kind of a statement. Mm -hmm. It's for me. Um, I think it's, it's a little more, you know, almost friend to friend and being conspirational saying, holy crap, you know, I, I've come to realize this is, this is meant for me, just for me, you know? And I think he does that perhaps in a sense of awe or amazement, um, not, not to say that, hey, I'm, I'm really important and you're not, but I think he wants us to reach that same conclusion. And yet I feel that we can't. In other words, and yet I feel that that's so personal, in a way we can never really get into what's in his head, right? Um, there's no question that Shinran went through a period of deep despair. There's no question about that. And that somehow meeting home had transformed him. And that he found some way out of rope, you know, to climb up out of where he was. Uh, and how bad that was and what really was going on, it's hard to know. Um, and if, you, if you look at Shinran's talking about his own kind of liberation, his own satori, mm -hmm. which it definitely is. And you talk about Honen talking about his, his satori, they're quite different. Honen clearly was searching and searching and searching, and then he reads Shandao, and then the, all the light bulbs turn on, you know. And he, the whole thing fits. Uh, in some sense, Honen is so learned, and yet there's a lot of things that don't work, that don't fit together, and it's not producing the sense of liberation, and then you read Shandao and then it happens. It does work. Shinran, you don't get that sense. Shinran, you get the sense of, fuck, <laughs> what the hell do I do now, you know? It's like really bad. And then, so he's really been pulled out from the depth. So in that sense, Honen's writings are more emotional, more intense. Um, yes, what is your view of this? Um. Still working on it, honestly. I, I don't have a good answer for you. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Oh, you know what struck me it was that passage about the true and trusting opponent is the gift granted by the Tathagata, mm -hmm. and um, the true and trusting of Shoning is also a gift from the Tathagata. Mm -hmm. And so, however, they received that gift from Tathagata. Tathagata, I'm not sure that that, I, the receiving of it was the same. But the process, I mean, I think that, um, I think that the process is different. My causes and conditions for being here today is, I mean, you know, for all of us, they're all, it's all different. And so how we arrive to where we're sitting today, I can't see that. Um, it's, it's all going to be the same. I'm not sure that how I understand true teaching is going to be the same as how maybe Katie understands it, or the fact that Nembutsu is true. What does that mean for me? Might be different for what Katie mm -hmm. arrives at. But um, I think I think it's very honest. I mean, he is very humble, but I think it's very honest in that humility. And um, I, 
you know, I, I think I mentioned, you know, I am taking um, Reverend Matsumoto's class, which is the introduction to Shin Buddhism, and I thought, oh, great, you know, now I can maybe feel a little more confident Get when I try to share it. the dark, right, but I have more questions than I have answers. I'm not sure I came away with, I came away with some answers, but it's that perspective, I think, and uh, the fact that I have more questions, what where I am confident is, I think I can go forward a little bit better and try to figure out for myself, what is that true nimbutsu? What does that mean for me? And maybe if I can arrive at that, maybe then I can more authentically share that with somebody else. So I, that's kind of where I'm landing right now. The quotation that, that uh, Vaughn shared uh, is absolutely one of the most moving Shin quotations for me. And, and I feel that the statement, the Nembutsu is only for me, is really a, a statement of maturation. Uh, when I was 20, 25, 30, I knew everything. I knew what right and wrong was. Uh, and then I, I lived another 40 years, and, and I don't have a clue a lot of times what's right and wrong. Uh, I've done things that I thought were right that were really wrong. And frankly, I've done things that I thought were wrong, and they turned out to be right. right. Yeah. Um, for me, Shin Buddhism probably wouldn't have appealed to me at 20, 25, but it really hits me at 66. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's great. Cindy. <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, I'm thinking of this from the perspective of um, me having to do my research paper on hearing and saying your name. Ah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so you kind of know where I'm going with this. Um, so what I get from this is the fact that Nembutsu is Amida Buddha's primal vow. Um, and Nembutsu is Amida Buddha, basically. And so if you know, w one has uh, uh, Shinji, and then everyone has this, the same vow they, they believe <laughs> Um, like, kind of how Hirano Sensei was saying that, you know, everyone's faith then is the same. So, when I say Namo Amidabutsu, it's, it's Amida Buddha telling me, as well as people who hear the name, to listen to the vow. I don't know if that... <laughs> no, that's fine. I, I just, it, it made me think of something else, actually, in relation to what the other two chapters you read today, which is, um, the, everything we read in these last three sections is about what true Shinjin should look like, right, and how it should be. But there's no discussion of what happens to people who don't have Shinjin, who hear all this, but still don't have Shinjin, right? In a sense, that's one of the problems. It's like Satori and Zen, you know, that's supposed to be liberating you. What happens if you don't? What happens if you go through your life and it never occurs? You know what I'm saying? Or if it does. Or if it does, then what? It could be even worse, right? Be careful what you wish for. You might not like it. You might not like it, yeah. So Shinjin is a little tricky, and in that sense, Shinjin is kind of similar in, in Shinron because it's a sine qua non. You have to have it, or everything doesn't seem to work. And not everybody's going to get it. And so. This brings up the question is, well, maybe we should redefine Shinjin and make it easier to get so that everybody can get it. <laughs> and I tell you, you know, again, here, I'm not making a judgment call, but, you know, the Nishinigashi forms of Honganji are a little bit different. And the Senjuji branch of Shinju also is a little bit different. Um, the Senjuji branch and the Higashi branch very much see Shinjin as a religious awakening. Okay. It's an experience. You, it's not an intellectual acceptance of a set of beliefs. You have to experience it. And if you don't, everything is just sort of an intellectual justification. It's a nice story, but it doesn't work in the same way. 
And so the requirement that you have to have Shinjin on the Higashi side and the, the Shinjuji side is not so strong as it seems to be on the Nishi side. And so therefore, I think Shinjin means something different in Nishi. In other words, it seems to me it's a statement of I accept these principles, I believe in them, uh, whether or not I have any kind of a religious experience or not. So, for example, if you look at back to Kiyozawa again, Kiyozawa said, you can't understand what the Buddha is doing unless you've exhausted everything you can possibly do yourself. You have to push self-power jidihi to the end, to the limit. You have to stop eating. You have to stop sleeping. You have to go out and beg. You have to, and you have to do this constantly until you get to the point that there's nothing left. And then you'll see what Tariki is all about. You can't just intellectually decide, oh, Tariki is convenient and cool and I like it and it's attractive. That Tariki for Kiyozawa was superficial and not based on experience as he understood it. So um, the Nishi people therefore hated Kiyozawa. I'm telling you, the stuff they wrote against him was so vituperative, you can't imagine. That's the wrong way to go. Don't ask people to do that. What are you talking about? That's not who we are, blah, 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 blah. They wanted a pastoral, relaxed, conservative, easy to follow church. Um, and Kiyozawa refused to do that. Um, and so that led to, again, a lot of tension. Okay? Um, so I don't have the answer to this. I'm just telling you that this is a tricky point. Okay? And then even on the Nishi side, you know, all this emphasis on Shinjin is this. Is the basis of what your faith is. If you don't have Shinjin, or your Shinjin may not be the same as my Shinjin, or how to, you know what I'm saying? You can use the right kind of language, but you can learn in a textbook how to define it and then just reiterate that. Does that really mean you have Shinjin? That's a problem. That's a problem for Shin, uh, culture as a whole. And in some sense, there has to be a place for you. The Jodo Shu, for example, does not require this. You, there has to be a place for people who don't have Shinjin to still feel that they're included. To still feel they have a future in their religion, you know what I'm saying? Um, and so I think that's what the Kangyo, the Contemplation Sutra is trying to do. But anyway, so, yeah. Do, do you think that Shinan in his writings said just, I mean, you know, the, what is it, the 19th and 20th vow are provisional right. means, right? But that the 18th vow is the primal vow. Do you think? No, they're all called primal vows. They're, they're all, all yes. Mm -hmm. Shinran uses the same. Ongan refers to all 48 vows. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. No, sometimes it does refer only to the 18th vow, but you can't, you can't know that for sure. Unless someone says that. Okay. Primal vow, if you want to use that translation, refers to all vows. Okay. Of the Buddha, all of them. But the, 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 the true teaching. The, for Shinran, for Shinran, the kind of conclusion of the whole thing, the focus, it's all leading up to. The 18th row, that's definitely, yes. But I guess, because we had this discussion, um, so is there anywhere that says that Shinon said, just go straight to the 18th? I've never seen that, but I mean, you could certainly, if you wanted, obviously that's his conclusion. Mm -hmm. Honan said the same thing, so you could certainly go there if you wanted to. But then why does he bother with the 19th and 20th vows then? Okay. You know what I'm saying? There is a process, there is a practice that's important. You have to go through various, you know. Obviously, he sees this as a system. He sees this as being, you know, there being some structure for doing this. And I don't think Shinran's the first person to think that way either. You know, I think there's, there, there, there's precedent for that also. Uh, I think, you know, the, so go back to the language of primal vow. Mm -hmm. that, that translates hongan. The word hongan has been used at that time because I read a lot of this material. It refers to all the vows of the Buddha. Mm -hmm. And any, because they're, they're defined as hongan. They're all written in the sutra as hongan. Okay, hon doesn't mean primal, sorry. Hon means previously created. Moto yori, that's what it means. In other words, it's a translation of the Sanskrit word purva. Purva pranidana, pranidana is the vow. Purva just means in the past, okay? Because these are not the vows of Amida Buddha. These are the vows of Dharmakara Bodhisattva. Mm -hmm. So the, the word hongan refers to the fact that these were made before he was a Buddha. That's what the that's what the hong means. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, because they have enormous religious significance, the term primal vow came to be a very popular translation for them. Uh, but I certainly never use that term. That's not saying that they're not primal, primal, whatever that means, but in any case, that's not what the term means in Chinese, certainly, okay? 
Uh, okay, we have one more. Sorry. Confession, Sharon? <laughs> no confession. No confession. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not giving it up. You're not giving it up? All right. <laughs> okay, I, the only thing that I want to add to this is to me, uh, all of this uh, goes down to the, comes back or can be reduced to the term ordinary person, right? Yeah. Bone boo. Which is really, really powerful, and this is a real innovation of Shandao. This is Shandao's massive contribution to Buddhist history, uh, and it's not a doctrinal or philosophical contribution because the term "ordinary being" put jhana in Sanskrit is all over the Buddhist canon. What Shandao did that really, really changed things was he said, "Everybody." should see their religion in terms of being an ordinary person. In other words, it's a kind of psychological tool to say to yourself, no matter how advanced I am, or you are, or anybody is, you should always see things as a novice, as a child, always see things as someone who needs to be helped, okay? As being ordinary, not as being sacred. And for Shandao, this is a kind of, I don't know, I call it like an existential confession in a way. Uh, and I think he's sincere in that. And again, because I'm, you know, I'm translating his commentary on the contemplations of Dura, and I was telling Marvin at lunch, you know, he goes through those 13 contemplations in enormous detail. Honen and Shinran don't do that. It's clear that Shandau practice all those visualizations very, very seriously. Uh, so when you come to, when you read that stuff and you read his psychological confessions of his own psychological experience, and these visualization meditations and how difficult they were, you realize this is no ordinary person, okay? Shandao is a genius. There's no question about it. I mean, he's one of the great geniuses in Buddhist history. But he concludes by saying, I'm an ordinary person, you know? And so he doesn't do that on the basis of some rational judgment of what's my IQ? Like Trump says, I'm a really smart guy. What's my IQ, you know? Shandao says that because he's truly humble, you know, and he wants every he wants to communicate Buddhism in that way, and Honen gets this, and Honen that's part of Honen's enlightenment, that's part of Shinran's enlightenment, and so this flies in the face of the traditional Indic view that the more difficult the practice, the greater the achievement, and what Shandao would say is do the difficult practices, but always stay humble. And realize you're still a beginner, you're always a beginner. I think that kind of beginner's mind, the Suzuki Shunyu said in San Francisco Zen Center, you know, the same kind of thing. It's really beautiful, it's very powerful, and very, very um, you know, inspirational, I think, and will always be so. I just want to say, not my own understanding of it, but your passionate expression of it helps me to see it as a really liberating experience the way you describe it and again not my understanding but just you explaining it it just seems like going in that deeply to understand it at that level and kind of just sifting through sifting through the layers of it it just seems like in the act, in the end to say the vow is for me is the Shenzhen is the true liberation that comes from that. And I think goes back to what was, Sensei was saying was, it is a deeply personal experience after all of that process. Yeah. Thank you, that's very nice. So. Okay, I guess we're done. And then that's how we have to thank uh, Dr. Love for always. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.